The message for today is entitled, What is Christianity? How many of you have traditionally called yourself Christians? Let me see your hand. I put up both of mine on that one. If I could put my feet up, I would put those up too. Many of us have traditionally referred to ourselves by that designation of Christian. And most of us have called ourselves that because we were raised that way. Um, our parents were Christians, you know, our grandparents were Christians. Whether it was Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, uh, whatever, we called ourselves Christians. And I'm not sure, brothers and sisters, that everybody is clear on what is Christianity. As a boy, just like Brother Penny there, he reminded me so much of myself. I was very apt, and I took notice of everything. My eyes didn't miss nothing. Just like your child's eyes. Don't miss nothing. Look at the person next to you and say, when you think they're not looking, they're looking. Don't ever forget that. As a boy, I was the personification of the question why. I asked why to almost everything. I remember my parents telling me, boy, I don't ask so many questions. And you may have said that to your children now and again. I remember my parents saying to me, you don't need to know the answer to that. I remember that. Even in school, I remember my teachers saying to me, your questions aren't important. What you really need to do is develop a skill working with your hands. That's what I remember teachers saying to me. Yes, as a child, I knew there was somebody out there who didn't want me to think. And guess what, y'all? There are people that don't want you to think. There are people that don't want you to think. In all, and I mean all, of my Sunday school literature, I noticed that everyone who was used of God in the literature was white. And all of the bad people, they weren't black, but they had dingy, a dingy appearance. They weren't as clean looking as, as everybody else. They were tinted or whatever, and I just kind of assumed it was like, you know, because they had been working or something. But you take people like Goliath. Goliath was always portrayed as an unclean person. He just had to, you know, he hadn't shaved and you know, real bearded kind of thing, you know, kind of rusky looking face. You take people like Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, these people were portrayed as dirty or not as clean or as lily white as others in my literature. What's really deep is I remember my grandmother, God bless her heart, sweetest woman. In fact, she was, the, she was Jesus personified to me growing up because I had never really seen Jesus and the only image or person I had to kind of come close to who I thought God was like was my grandmother. Yeah, yeah. And that's how children see us. You know, y'all need to remember the closest thing that a child has to God is you. Right. Remember that. My grandmother had a huge picture of the Last Supper in the dining room. See, back in those days, we had dining rooms. Don't have dining rooms now. You know, you got a little kitchenette area. You know, and, if, and that's by design, people. See, the most important time of the day is for the family to sit down and eat together. You notice houses that they're building now don't have dining rooms, you know? It's deep. 
This huge picture of the Last Supper, I'll never forget it because I used to study this picture even as a boy and I noticed that there was this big long table. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all see? So, oh, a lot of hands are up. Maybe y'all probably got them in your house too, right? <laughs> you know, this big long table with 12 white men behind it. And something about that picture was strange to me even as a child, but I didn't know what it was. Now I know what it was. And when I'm going to share this with you, you go look at your picture and see if you see what I'm talking about. The first thing wrong with that picture is they're sitting at a table. That's right. They didn't sit at tables back in that day. They sat on the floor. That's the first thing wrong with that picture. The second thing strange about that picture is all 12 men are sectioned off in groups of threes. Think about it. See, I'm going to try to study. See, I, this, I used to notice this years ago. Why are they all in groups of threes? Three, six, nine, twelve. And then the other thing was, underneath the table, the tablecloth comes down to a certain level, but underneath the table, there are four legs. One leg under each group of men. Now tell me, was I doing some analyzing or what? And of course, the sun was in the middle. Now I know what it is. The three men are the three months of each season. The three, four, the four groups of threes representing three months in the four seasons of the year. So again, it's back to that zodiac thing. Summer, winter, spring, and fall. And that's what each leg of the table represents, a season of the year. I said, oh, this is deep. What really did it for me was the love that my grandmother had for a man called Oral Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. Oral Roberts was the most popular preacher in my community. I remember my grandmother taking me with her many times to the corner store to get a money order to send to Oral Roberts so that he could send back his gift to her. This one time in particular, she had to get this gift from Oral Roberts. And I, you know, me being, I thought it was like a big toy or something, because, I mean, you know, that's the only thing that really fancied me. And when this gift came, it blew my mind. It was an 11 by 17 size picture of Jesus. Of course, he didn't look like me. He didn't look like my grandmother. He didn't look like anybody in my family. But it was the most prized possession in our home. My grandmother hung this picture of Jesus up over the couch. That's what we called it. What do y'all call it? A sofa or something? I was a little boy. Y'all call it a couch too? Okay. My grandmother hung this big picture, and it was huge to me. I'm a little boy, and it was 11 by 17 size picture. Hung it right up in the center of the wall over the couch in the living room. And the real thing that blew my mind is she told me, and I'll never forget these words, she said, Oh, Robert said, no matter where you move in the room, Jesus is looking at you. That's what they used to say. I remember that. And see, I didn't, as a boy, I didn't understand you know, the, how art, I mean, if you take a picture looking in the camera, and that's how it's going to look. And it thing scared me because no matter, and I, you know, I put it to the test. I'd hide over here and look, and he was looking at me, you know. And I, I'd go over here and hide behind this, this chair and peep around, and lo and behold, he was looking at me. I was like, oh, this is deep, you know. This white man is watching me. You know, I'm a little boy now. But something just didn't set right with me about these white images, and especially that big picture. But I had no other information to stand on. Why was it that this man, Oral Roberts, had more respect from my grandmother than all of the blacks in my family and community combined? He had no idea who we were. 
We had never met him. And my fact, we didn't see him. She listened to him on the radio. But I knew that my grandmother would send a money order to this man every time she got her check. What was this power over my grandmother? and so many others just like her. What was this power? What was this power that made my grandmother stand in front of this 11 by 17 picture of this white Jesus and cry as she talked to it? And then when she would walk away from it, she would sing this song, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. What was this power? It's deep, y'all. I remember, see, this thing was so real to my grandmother. And I watched this. This thing was so real to my grandmother. I said, man, I need to try this. So I went and stood in front of her, looked up at her. And I talked to it, and when I talked to it, something said to me, you fool. Right. I mean, even as a little kid, I knew this picture wasn't going to talk back to me. You understand what I'm saying? And when I would talk to it, what really blew my mind is when I talked to the thing, guess what happened, y'all? My brain went to work, and instead of really looking for an answer back, I'm looking, I'm saying, wait a minute. Why is this picture in color? <laughs> All of the pictures in my house were black and white. I mean, back at that time, it was black and white pictures, y'all. We didn't come out with color pictures yet. So why was this picture in color? Again, the programming. Many years later, I was able to understand that the image that we were given to worship as our redeeming savior, Messiah, was the image of the conquering European right. and obviously our slave masters. In the definition of its true purpose, the subject again today is what is Christianity? So in the definition of its true purpose, and this is the Ray Hagen's definition. This is not out of Webster's Dictionary. All right, it's not out of any resource. This is my own personal definition. Christianity may be defined as a Euro-Gentile psycho-philosophical vehicle of spiritual and intellectual enslavement, which has as its end three things. Let me say that part again. Christianity may be defined as a Euro-Gentile psycho-philosophical vehicle of spiritual and intellectual enslavement, which has as its end three things. The first thing it has as its end is the cultural, everybody say cultural, and racial superiority of the people who created it. Did y'all hear that? Yes. The first goal is the cultural and racial superiority of the people who created it. The second thing, and say this with me, is the paralysis of analysis. The paralysis of analysis. Come on, say it like you mean it. The paralysis of analysis. You know what that means, brothers and sisters? Paralysis of analysis means that you don't think. You don't exercise your critical thinking faculties. People say stuff to you, and you just let it Go in one ear and, and fall inside your head wherever it may and don't even challenge it, question it, nothing. So the second goal of this program is a paralysis of analysis by those who believe in it. And the third thing is, and everybody say this, the perpetual empowerment, the perpetual empowerment. of the agenda, of the agenda. 
intended by it. Intended by it. Now, did y'all get those three things? Listen to me now. Listen to me. Number one, again, the cultural and racial superiority of the people who created it. Number two, the paralysis of analysis by those who believe in it. And number three, the perpetual empowerment of the agenda intended by it. In order for those, and I'm talking to you, my brothers and sisters, and those of you who are watching this, in order for those who have been misled to begin to see correctly, you must have a clear analytical understanding of the origin, of the strategies, of the mechanics, of the purpose and methods of the device that has blinded you in the first place. Yeah. You must understand what it is that's blinding you. I remember reading about, I think it was Harriet Tubman that had the Underground Railroad, wasn't it? Yes. They tell me she freed 300 slaves. Ain't that what they, they say? According to records, she says, I would have freed more if they had known they were slaves. Isn't that deep? It's bad, brothers and sisters, when you are looking through the lenses or the paradigm of what your oppressor wants you to look through and think that you're seeing the truth. Oh, yeah. When it comes to the liberation of the African mind from European concepts, we must examine and re-examine again and again those agencies that has Europeanized our thinking until we are truly disconnected from the tentacles of their grasps. Everybody repeat this with me, please, or after me. When you adopt a God, who is not in your own image when you embrace literature that teaches you to hate yourself and love your enemy when your oppressor and savior and your God and enslaver are one and the same you become the principal agent in your own destruction. Did y'all understand that paragraph? Now I notice a lot of y'all just sat there and looked at me when I was trying to use a technique that we as educators use. And that is called restating what the instructor is saying so it'll help take up residence in your mind. But again, some don't want to wake up. Now let's try that again, all right? I'm looking at you this time, and I want to see who insists on staying asleep. Re repeat, repeat this. When you adopt a God who is not in your own image, when you embrace literature that teaches you to hate yourself, your enemy when your oppressor and savior and your God and enslaver are one and the same. You become the principal agent in your own destruction. And that's what's been happening, people. Today, I'm going to help you see if you want to see. All right. All right. I got to say that now. Because I found out everybody don't really want to see. Right. I'm going to help you see if you want to see the deception of the Euro Gentile powers called Christianity. The creation of Christianity and the incarnate carnated logos Christ was not an act or event, brothers and sisters. It not, wasn't something that just happened and, and took root. It was a process that began in the year 332 BC and went all the way up to the year 553 AD. 
Y'all know that's almost 800 years? Listen to this. Almost 800 years of progress in making this thing take hold in the minds of the masses. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Take that back, it's almost 900 years, isn't it? Yeah. To this day, there is no historical data, archaeological or biographical evidence in existence to substantiate the life of anyone called Jesus the Christ. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of John L. McKenzie. John L. McKenzie is a scholar by their standards. And John L. McKenzie, how many of you have ever heard of this thing called the Dictionary of the Bible? Y'all yes. hear that? Okay, well, John L. McKenzie is the author of the Dictionary of the Bible. And on page 432, John McKenzie states these words, and I quote, The writing of the life of Jesus has been a major problem in New Testament scholarship for more than 100 years. After numerous shifts of opinion, the consensus of scholars is that the life of Jesus cannot be written. The reason is that the data for an historical biography does not exist. The only sources of the life and teaching of Jesus are in the four Gospels, and I will quote them in the order in which they were written and not in the order that we've been taught. Mark first, not Matthew, mm -hmm. then Matthew and Luke, and then John was added in the fourth century. So then how did Jesus come into existence? Well, let's help you understand, brothers and sisters, what it is that we were born into, raised by, and never really got a historical understanding of its origin. Everybody say Alexander. Alexander. Now, as you know, in, in, in school, our youth are caught, taught to call this man Alexander the Great. By the way, this is a real historical person. Alexander, in my opinion, there was nothing great about him. So I call him Alexander the Greek. I call him Alexander the Barbarian. See, it depends on whose perspective you're looking at. Now, if, you, if you're looking at it from a European perspective, then you might say Alexander the Great. I mean, if you know, if you, if you look at uh, Christopher Columbus from an Italian or Spaniard perspective, you may say he was a great man. If you look at Christopher Columbus from the perspective of the Native American, he was a murderer. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, so it depends on whose perspective you're looking at this thing from. This man was an invader. He invaded Egypt in 332 BC and when he went in he removed the existing Pharaoh and put himself in his place. But check this out. You just walk up into a land, take the king off his throne and you take the throne and you sit on it. But yet you have not the slightest idea of what it means to be a king in this culture. He insisted that the ancient Egyptian priest's society would recognize him as a god, small g-o-d. See, brothers and sisters, one of the things you need to understand is in ancient Kemet, all of the pharaohs were considered gods, small g-o-d. And Alexander insisted that the secret order of Kemet would recognize him as a god and accept him into their spiritual institutions. Alexander knew that in order to effectively rule Egypt, he had to be accepted into their secret order. The Egyptians had a good habit in practice though, and I wish we could kind of return to it today. The Egyptians did not accept 
Hear me now, hear me. They did not accept persons from other races or cultures into their sacred order. Y'all hear that? What did I just say? Not into their secret order, right. They didn't accept other races. They didn't accept other cultures into their secret order. So therefore, the priest of Egypt wasn't about to make Alexander a part of their society. Mm. So what he did <laughs> is he demanded that they make him a god or a sa-ra. This was the world's first form of racism or white supremacy. Alexander died in 323. The Egyptians never did acknowledge him as a god. So guess what happened? His successor was known as Ptolemy the First. Now, so y'all understand, whenever y'all hear the word Ptolemy, I'm talking about invader pharaohs. I'm talking about European pharaohs that didn't belong in Egypt. But they had usurped the throne. And Ptolemy the First, nicknamed Lagi or Lagi, assumed the throne. And his nickname was Soter. Everybody say Soter. Soter. You may want to write it down. It's spelled S-O-T-E-R. Soter, brothers and sisters, means Savior. Oh, shucks now. Watch how this thing comes into play. Y'all can say, that's how this happened? Soter, his nickname means Savior. Well, and he was called that because of his many military conquests. So Ter also tried to get himself accepted into the ancient Egyptian priest's order. But he too was rejected. Why? He wasn't an Egyptian. In fact, he was a European who didn't belong in Kemet in the first place. Yeah, buddy. However, now this is how this stuff gets, this is how this stuff makes me so angry. However, he found a council of what is called Melkite Coptic Egyptians. Priests in the city of Menefer, or what is now known today as Memphis, Egypt. And guess what they did? Look at the person next to you and say, no matter what, no what. somebody's going to be a sellout. Be a sellout. <laughs> Every time, brother, somebody is going to be a sellout. And that's what these Melkite Coptic Egyptians did. They sold out. They violated the ancient principles of not allowing foreign cultures or people into their secret order. And these priests in Memphis complied with the request of Ptolemy I and made a composed or composed a title for him. And what they did is they took the two names that were very special names in Egypt. The first name was Asar who we call Osiris. Yes, yes. The second name was Apis, yes. which is the sacred bull in Kemet. They combined the two names, Asar Apis, mm -hmm. and came up with the word Serapis. Oh, right. Write it down, S-E-R-A-P-I-S. Can I educate y'all today? Y'all yeah. don't mind this education now, do you? See, the only way you're going to be free is educating your African mind. S-E-R-A-P-I-S. -E it came up with the word Serapis. Now, the only place that Ptolemy I was accepted was there in Memphis. 
Throughout the rest of Egypt, they rejected him. So in his anger, let me tell you what the brother did. He went throughout Egypt and shut down all of the temples. Yeah, buddy. And this was the beginning of the elimination of the spiritual unity that the priests of Kemet maintained with each other. Serapis was the bearded icon that became known as the Savior. Y'all yes. yes. seen these pictures of the bearded Christ? Y'all ever noticed Jesus always got a beard? After the closing of the temples in Kemet, Ptolemy I, or Sotir, confiscated all of the divine, sacred, inspired writings which were written on papyrus scrolls and stored them in the only remaining temple in Memphis, and that was the one where they coronated him and made him Sotir. From that time on, every Ptolemy ruler Roman ruler became what is called the vicar of Serapis. Even up to today, we still have a man called the vicar of Serapis or of Christ, and he's known as the Pope. Can I give y'all some more information? All right. Everybody say Ptolemy the Fifth. And the, and the Rosetta Stone. All right, now let's come up a few hundred years now, just, just, right. just, 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 just a couple hundred years, if that, if that far. In the year 197 through 195 BC, guess what they did, brothers and sisters? There was this stone that was created by a new generation of Melkite Coptic Egyptians who made up the general council of priests and priestesses in the Dionysian temple in Egypt, in Memphis, the same city. This stone was created to celebrate the first commemoration of the coronation of Ptolemy V, and Ptolemy V's name was Epiphanes. His nickname was Eucharistos. Everybody say that, Eucharistos. Eucharistos. One more time, say it, Eucharistos. Eucharistos. One more time. Eucharistos. What word do you hear in there that's very special in the Catholic Church? Eucharist. Eucharist, right. The ritual that was created in honor of Ptolemy V, Epiphanes Eucharistos, was called the Eucharist and attached to the image of Serapis. Now follow this thing. Here you have this image of what we now today call the Christ. And now they have created this ritual of drinking some blood and eating some flesh and attach that ritual to this image and now you see how it gets connected yes. there. This ritual was also made a part of his title. And this ritual became the first order of service in the Dionysian or Dionysian and other religious temples in Alexandria and Antioch. The Roman Catholic Church, who did I say? The Roman Catholic Church, brothers and sisters, has deceived the world. I say it again, the Roman Catholic Church has deceived the world. Y'all hear me? They have deceived the world by teaching that this ritual is something called the Lord's Supper. This ritual existed long before a so-called Jesus was even born. The Roman Catholic Church still honors Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, to this very day in what is called the Epiphany. Yes, that's right. Where do you think they got the word from? The Epiphany, from Epiphanes Eucharistos, also called 
the little Christ. And guess when they celebrate it every year? From December 26th through January the 6th. And on the January the 6th, it's called the 12th night. The epiphany. Well, that's how all this stuff started happening. Well, then it goes up a few more hundred years. You got all this stuff going on, and we're going to deal with it in depth as we deal with the council meetings in our 9 o'clock session in our midweek study. But now I want to touch on the five council meetings. The ecumenical councils of the Roman Catholic Church were the events, what did I say? Yes. The events that completely transformed what began with Ptolemy the first Soter into the Euro-Gentile religion that dominates the Western world today through these Roman Catholic councils. You see, brothers and sisters, let me, let me make it plainer to you. Approximately 305 AD, somewhere around that time period, 305 AD, there was a great controversy between two factions of Egyptian priests, the Melkite Coptic Egyptians and the exterior Coptic Egyptian priests. And this faction went on over the sacred writings. What did, over the what? Sacred writings. Right. In other words, the sacred writings were of Egyptian origin. Long before there was a Matthew, long before, in fact, take that back, <laughs> long before there was a concept of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Isaiah for that matter, or Ezekiel, or Daniel, the ancient sacred writings were written by the scribes and sacred authors of ancient Kemet. They wrote the words of the gods or the Metuneta on papyrus scrolls and they kept them in the temples. And the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire became so powerful and such a tyrant that they demanded complete, absolute control. So they ended up securing these sacred writings. And these writings were handed to the Roman Emperor Diocletian. This controversy centered around the Serapis image. Follow this well. They were actually having an argument over this image. Which the Roman Empire had decided to force upon the people. There was this brother. Thank God there's always somebody that's willing to stand up for the truth. There was this brother named Arius from Alexandria, a black man, an African, who stood up and said, wait a minute, I want y'all to know something here. I don't know, maybe he's a great ancestor of mine, I don't know. <laughs> He stood up and said, I want y'all to know something. I want y'all to know that this image, this bearded figure that has become so popular, who we're all calling Soter or Savior, I want y'all to know that that image is a fabrication. All right. All right. All right. It was made up to please this white pharaoh. Well, people had begun to accept this thing. And for him to come along and say some stuff like this, it was causing some problems. So it literally resulted in a council meeting. Spearheaded, see, when Constantine came into power, the Roman emperor, that was that all this war was going on over this image of Serapis. And when he came into power in 323 AD, he decided to convene a council to expand the worship of the Serapis image throughout East Africa, Europe, and Southwest Asia. 
now followed his people, in order for Constantine to do this effectively, he needed the spiritual validation of the exterior Coptic religious community. He already had the Melkite Coptic Egyptian community. He needed the exterior Coptic religious community to back him up. So guess what he did? Again, everybody say sell out. Sell out. Lord have mercy. Y'all, this stuff ain't just happening today. The tie sell has been going on for a long time. He found a sellout. He approached this bishop whose name was Sylvester. And he went to Sylvester and told Sylvester, listen, man, let me tell you something. I'm the Pope. I'm the HWIC. <laughs> I guess I should say H-N-I-C, huh? In the real sense of the word. I'm the Pope. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the emperor. I, I, I'm, I'm Constantine. And, and I want to be recognized in the Egyptian order. What in the world is it about Egypt? That white folks still trying to get up in there. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Yes. This ain't just start. It's something about the genius of Africa, the genius of Egypt. When they go there, they're in awe and they want to become a part of it. But they know that they have no ancestral connection to Egypt. So they have to try to command their way in. He went to Sylvester and said, listen, man, you are an Egyptian priest. I need you to do something for me. I need you to use your authority, Sylvester, and baptize me and make me an Egyptian through this ritual. If you do this, I'm going to do something for you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Is this thing making sense here? Yes. So Sylvester, whoo, buddy, 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 mm -mm -mm. baptized Constantine in the Egyptian sacred order. And that made Constantine a part of the belief system of ancient Kemet. Not really in his heart. You follow what I'm saying? But in order to rule effectively, he knew this was necessary. Now, now what the church has done, what the Christians have done, is they tell you that he constantly became a Christian. No, no. See, there was no Christianity at this time. Please understand this. What existed at this time was the ancient religion of the Northeast African people. And these Europeans wanted to be a part of it. So Sylvester baptized Constantine. And Constantine, in turn, made Sylvester the head of the Roman church. Oh, check this out. This thing is deep. It's called politics. Same stuff goes on today. You see, Constantine's main purpose was to get the Serapis image accepted because the Serapis image was European. It was the Christ. Y'all following what I'm saying? So Sylvester began to set up his own council of bishops and clergymen who went along with Constantine's program. Ain't that something? If you can just get a few people to sell out, man. Mm -mm -mm. Y'all, do you think that we're going to have a time where the black community will stop having sellouts? How many of y'all think we'll have it, that day is coming? You don't think that day is coming? Got it, got it. Well, something's going to have to happen. Mm, 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 mm. Well, when Sylvester put together his council to support Constantine's program, 
His council grew by appointment. Of course, he appointed his own flunkies to it. And of course, through this, they started the foundation for what we now know today as Christianity. By studying the council meetings of Nicaea in 325 AD, Constantinople, the first council in 381 AD, the Council of Ephesus, and I said that with emphasis because this is Ephesus, the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. When you study these five councils, brothers and sisters, which we are going to do over the next few weeks in our midweek study, you can clearly see how this religion came into being. This religion is not about freeing you. You all sleep if you want to. Tell the truth. It's not about freeing you. In fact, the people who fabricated it know it, it don't exist. It's not about freeing you. It's about what I say earlier, what are those three things? Cultural and racial superiority. Yes. Whose culture is held up in this religion? Yes. Not black folk, not the African culture. No, you don't see Africa in Christianity. You see Africans devoted to it though. But you don't see Africa in it. Not one, not one, not one, not one, not one black contributor put anything in this ear. Not one black contributor. Go to the Bible bookstore. Grab the dictionaries of theology. And you'll see not one contributor is a black man or a woman. Go get the study helps. You'll see not one contributor is black. In fact, most of them are German. Yes, sir. Kierkegaard. Yes. Yes. Baker. Yes. Woost. Yes. Holman. Yes. Sco yeah, Schofield. Yes. Definitely. All of these European figures are the people who are the commentators of this that we as black African people are so committed to. Brothers and sisters, it took 751 years from the creation of the Serapis image in 320 BC to the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD to transform this European image. We turn around and we start leaning and depending upon the emotionalization of ourselves to try to make real our belief. So what happens is our Practices become strategically structured to play on the string, strings of our emotions. And some of you, some of you sitting here may still have this, you, you, you may still be coming out of the withdrawal. Y'all know what, what it's like trying to, you know, withdraw from, from drug addiction. Look at, look at the person next to you and say, we do have some addicts in the church. And I'm not talking about drug addicts either. We got some addicts in the church, y'all, especially in the black church. The addicts that exist in the black church are addicts who need a fix of having a good time. In other words, church is meaningless to us unless we are gyrating. Church is meaningless to some of us if we ain't trying to make these chandeliers shake while we're going through our thing. Church is meaningless for some of us if we don't have a, a quickening of some kind. Y'all understand what I'm saying? See, brother, look at the person next to you and say when you're not getting information, you got to get the next best thing. And that's what the 
this is about. On today as Jesus the Christ. Therefore, now, I'll tell you the truth. Some, sometimes I was a huge fool. Yeah, did y'all mind that information? Oh. Huh? Now I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why I asked that question. Let me tell you why I asked that question. Because the programmers know everything I just told you. But why didn't they put it in the Sunday school literature that we all grew up with? The programmers know everything I just told you, but not. Any of what I just showed you was taught to us in our growing up years. Why not? And that is because it's not about you being free. It's not about your liberation in their mind. For you see, the only way that they can maintain the power is make sure that you remain powerless. I don't think y'all caught that. I better say it again. The only way that they can maintain the power is, main, is be sure that you remain powerless. And how do they ensure us remaining powerless? By calling on something that's not even real. Yeah. So guess what? Here's what we have to do. Let me let me show you the uh, uh, let me show you the, the the pathology of our actions here. When you call on that which is not real, you don't get an answer. Right? And if you don't get an answer, what is your recourse? When you don't know what else to do. They told us you ain't got enough faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. So since we don't have enough faith because we're trying to make real that which is not, we turn around and we start leaning and depending upon the emotionalization of ourselves to try to make real our belief. So what happens is our practices become strategically structured to play on the string, strings of our emotions. And some of you, some of you sitting here may still have this, you, you, you may still be coming out of the withdrawal Y'all know what, what it's like trying to, you know, withdraw from, from drug addiction? Look at, look at the person next to you and say, we do have some addicts in the church. And I'm not talking about drug addicts either. We got some addicts in the church, y'all, especially in the black church. The addicts that exist in the black church are addicts who need a fix of having a good time. In other words, church is meaningless to us unless we are gyrating. Church is meaningless to some of us if we ain't trying to make these chandeliers shake while we're going through our thing. Church is meaningless for some of us if we don't have a, a quickening of some kind. Y'all understand what I'm saying? See, brother, look at the person next to you and say, when you're not getting information, you got to get the next best thing. And that's what this is about. When you have a, a predicament where the leader or the teacher or the preacher is not prepared to liberate your African mind. Then that person has to lean back on the only thing they know. And if the only thing they know 
is that's what you're going to get am I telling the truth brothers and sisters that might be okay today you just might need a boost of something today to make you feel a little better, anesthetize you. Maybe, maybe somebody called you last night and, and hurt your feelings. So today you need a <laughs> But look at the person next to you and say, my feelings ain't hurt every Sunday. <laughs> Because I'm telling you the truth, after you, after you do that, for a whole 45 minutes, you don't know no more than you did before you got up that morning. You understand what I'm saying? And brothers and sisters, the only thing that's going to free your African mind is understanding the system that has imprisoned you. And once you know the truth, oh. a lot of the songs that I used to sing as a kid, I stopped singing them. But some of them I'm starting to sing again. I'm serious. For example, one of the songs we used to sing when I was a little boy, the Lord delivered me, why should I be bound? The Lord delivered me. Yeah. How many of y'all know that song? Yes, Some of y'all woke up since I started singing. You know that song? I mean, it came to life. <laughs> That's deep. Lord delivered me, why should I be bound? See, I stopped singing that for a while because it was like I was going through that transition stage. Now I sing it with a whole new African mind. I have been delivered. The Lord did deliver me. Yeah. But see, I used to I used to be saying He delivered me from from my my own people. Oh. He delivered me from the doctrines of racism. Yes. Yes. He delivered me from the oppressor's snare. Yes. Why should I be bound? Uh-uh. I will not be bound. Another song, Sister Kirkendall used to sing this all the time. And I think, I think she had the right idea. She just didn't know what she was singing. That's all, because the only thing she knew was English. You understand what I'm saying? She used to sing this song. My mind, my mind, my mind is gone. <laughs> my mind, my mind, my mind is gone. I say, whoa, what that, what that mean? <laughs> you done lost your mind? <laughs> now, with my African consciousness, I can sing that song. My mind, my mind, my mind. In other words, the mind that Europe gave me, yeah. I don't have that mind anymore. <laughs> It's gone. Yeah. I lost that mind. I got a new mind now. For the new millennium. So brothers and sisters, I can't leave y'all hanging with this idea. Well, if that's the case then, Pastor Ray, then what is it that I'm to believe? What is it that I should stand on? Look at the person next to you and say, stand on your African spirituality. Now, see, the thing is, a lot of us are suffering from cultural and spiritual amnesia. We've forgotten who we are. Many of us don't even remember our spirituality. It's in there. I guarantee you, I guarantee you. See, the spirituality that they tried to get us to understand is based on how much indoctrination you have. Y'all following what I'm saying? Yes. 
But it's a deep thing about African people that scares even them. And that is our, our brothers and sisters who can't read their doctrine. Have, a, have, a, have an insight and, and a spirituality that they can't understand. Because it's not documented. But the ancient African, whoo, good God Almighty, is in tune, not just with God, but with the universe. I remember, and I'm closing on this, I remember this movie that was out called The Green Mile. Awesome movie. It was a movie about African spirituality and how they wanted to incarcerate that African spirituality and how they literally put to death that African spirituality. But what was deep was when this man was in the prison cell and they was taking him to taking them to heal the warden's wife, he stepped outside and looked up in the sky and said, look boss, look boss. He reached down and picked up the earth and smelled it and said, smell this boss. And the white man looked at him and said, Okay, all right, all right, come on, come on, come on. Couldn't even tap into the spirituality of the earth of creation. That's what resides in us. That is the spirituality, y'all, that told your great grandmother what to do when you were sick. Something inside her African spirituality would cause her to go outside and get into the earth and get some stuff out the earth, come back in the house, make it and you take it and tomorrow, you be all right. That's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. So free your African minds, my African people, and don't allow yourself to be bound by their program of religion. Please return to your African spirituality. Yeah. And I guarantee you, a lot of stuff that you've been trying to make happen, it'll just start happening. Because you'll be in tune with the universe itself. And I got news for you, I got to close it, but I got news for you, when you get in tune with the universe, you can actually pull on the breast of creation and get divine milk. Yeah, buddy, give you all the strength you need, all the comfort you need, all the guidance you need, all the direction you need, all the wisdom you need, just because of who you are. 